Five years, 800 videos, over 100 of them featuring Seikos. But I've managed to avoid this one until now. Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch. On this channel, I have mostly tried to review watches that I personally like. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? We naturally gravitate towards the things in life we enjoy. Plus, it gets awkward talking about a watch when I'm not really into it and probably wouldn't wear it all that often myself. There are, of course, exceptions to the rule. I have reviewed plenty of weird, wacky and wonderful pieces that would only ever be occasional wear watches and pieces whose size, one way or the other, rule them out for me personally and I do enjoy the occasional Sunday roast. But generally speaking, if I'm not into it, then I don't review it. That's why there is one very common and very popular range of Seiko watches that I have very deliberately avoided. Perhaps you've guessed already from the silhouette on the thumbnail. It is a unique silhouette after all. It's the Seiko Kutura range. There are plenty of watches in the Kutura range, none of which I like the look of. And there is a fair chunk of irony in here, I think. I mean, integrated bracelets are so hot right now, but that doesn't seem to extend to the Kutura, does it? Quite clearly then, I did not just buy one of these. This one is kindly on loan to the channel from a Liverpudlian subscriber over in Perth, Australia called Paul. When he offered me his Kutura for review, I was honest about my thoughts and he said, no problem, go for it. So thank you, Paul. Now I know these watches do have plenty of fans, so please don't be offended. What I thought I'd do today is split the review objective and subjective. The first half, I'm gonna show you the watch, dimensions, specifications, features and functions, etc. In the second half, I'm gonna tell you why I'm just not into it. Let's flip the camera and get on with it. Let's start, as I so often do, by talking about money. And it's not just because I love the stuff, it does rather help add context to any review. This particular Kutura is the SSC743. As you can see, the going rate here in Oz is around 450. That's a pretty decent saving considering the Seiko list price is 750. Do bear in mind that warranty conditions will change depending on where you buy it from one year up to five years. But Paul managed to do much better than that. He picked his up on sale for 300 Aussie dollars. Now at the current exchange rate, that's a little over 200 US or 175 quid. On paper at least, that's a great price for a solar Seiko with Sapphire. And indeed the crystal was a big part of Paul's decision making process. Now Kutura may be a collection unto itself, but it seems that Seiko used their standard white box, which I'm sure you've seen many, many times before here and elsewhere. Now this is a larger watch and larger watches tend to be bought by larger people who need lots of spare links. So I was happy to see three spare links in the box for this one. Let's go straight to those dimensions then. This one has a diameter dimension of 45.5 millimeters, but a thickness of only 12.5. Because of the integrated bracelet, lug to lug is a little misleading. On Seiko's website, they advertise it as having a 56 millimeter lug to lug, which sounds gargantuan. And indeed, if this had a traditional case shape and was on a leather strap or something like that, it would be gargantuan. As it is, it's not that clear cut. For example, I could never wear a watch that big normally, but this one fits me comfortably. Again, lug width is misleading here because of the bracelet, so I'm gonna mark it as not applicable. Seiko rather unhelpfully described this watch as having 15 millimeters between the lugs. Trust me, ignore that figure. You're not putting this on anything other than the supplied bracelet. So a big and chunky watch therefore with a weight to match, sized up for me, it is 185 grams. All stainless steel, case, crown and bracelet. The case finish itself is pretty ordinary, high polish to the sides, but a nice satinized brush finish on those rather unusual upper lug surfaces. The crown is semi-guarded and is set with a black cabochon. It's just a push-pull crown, but the watch still has a claimed 100 meters of water resistance. The fixed bezel is all high polish and has that Omega Seamaster scalloped style. Set into the bezel is a very slim ceramic insert with a tachymeter scale on it. Really, this one is not about the finish, it's about the design, the scoops, the swoops, the angles and the arrows. But I'd probably better leave that till the second half of the video, hadn't I? If a bracelet is integrated, it had better be good. And actually, this one's okay. The highly decorated links are quite thick and chunky, which suits the watch overall. 
push pins hold them together, but that's okay for the money they're charging. And the swoopy, scoopy, scallopy look continues throughout. There's a satinized brushed center section with a high poly section at either side and another high poly section which looks almost like a wing in the middle of each link. The clasp is very simple, Seiko stamped, double pusher and pressed. And for once, I'm not gonna complain about that because it means the clasp is very unobtrusive. It's very slim, you can't feel it and you can barely see it. But no half links are provided and there's no form of adjustment. So we've got a 45 plus diameter watch with 180 grams of weight that you're either wearing tight or loose if you don't get lucky with fitment. Seiko do affordable dials like no one else. And regardless of my ultimate conclusion here today, I gotta give them props for this dial. It has a whole checkerboard parquetry floor thing happening, which you really have to see in motion to appreciate. No photo is ever gonna do this thing justice, no render the same. You get these two diagonal waves moving either towards or away from the pinion, depending on the angle. It's really trippy and I've never seen anything quite like it. High poly silver indices are applied. They look quite similar to those that feature on Recraft range Seikos, by the way. 12 indices, but to my eye anyway, five different sizes of indices. The one at 12 is the biggest, the one at six is the smallest. Five and seven are somewhere in between. The nine is a little bit short and the remaining six are all the same size. This is due to the fact they've gone for three different sized sub-registers. The 1224 sub-register at the three o'clock is the smallest. The ticking second hand at the nine o'clock is in between and the multi-function indicator at six is the biggest. Seiko clearly giving us a clue there of their order of importance. They underline that further still by not framing the 1224, putting a silver frame around the ticking second and a big shiny red frame around the multifunction dial at six, which they hold on with two decent sized screws. Again, more on all of this later. The hands are super sharp and very pointy, sword shaped, semi-skeletonized and half loomed. They're also that half brush, half polish style which you get on certain Seikos and I must admit I like a lot. The central chronograph hand is very slender and not actually all that legible therefore. It's silver at the base and red at the tip which kind of disappears against the black and somewhat inexplicably has a little square of loom halfway down it. At least the red ties in with the big disc around the six o'clock subdial and the red hour markers on the angle chapter ring. They double brand this one as a Seiko Couture. The Seiko logo is applied and they proudly advertise that it's solar. I'm sure you saw the purple hue to the center of those registers. That's a signature of Seiko solar cells. Overall, a lot of effort has clearly gone into the dial and the handset. You definitely get your $300 worth in that respect. You perhaps don't quite get $300 worth of loom though. Four small loom pips at the four points of the compass and loom on the tips of each hand. Well, I say the tip, it's halfway down that chronograph hand as discussed. Lumi Bright always does a decent job though, and the two main hands are still clearly visible at the end of my test. On paper, the dimensions of this watch fill me with dread rather than joy. On wrist, however, it actually wears really nicely. As discussed though, unless you hit the jackpot, you've either got a choice of tight or loose. I don't know about you, but I rather like the blood circulating through my fingers, so I chose loose. And when you wear it like that, all 185 of those grams come into effect. But wait, what are those? Those, my friends, are shorts. It's been a long and tough winter here in Sydney, but spring has sprung and my hairy legs are back on show for the next nine months. So here endeth the objective component of this review. If you pay well under retail for one of these, you get a big brand Japanese watch with sapphire crystal, it'll never need a battery. It's got a stopwatch with a date on it. You can take it swimming without worrying. And if you do hit the jackpot in terms of sizing, it does a pretty good job of vanishing on your arm. It really is very, very comfortable for a big watch. And the dial is pretty spectacular in the right light, but I'm afraid I'm just not a fan of the way these things look. I think they look horribly dated. I mean, what are we thinking? Late nineties, early noughties? There's clearly a lot of thought and effort has gone into making those links of the bracelets look as ugly as possible. There's a whiff of predator armor about them, so maybe we're even back into the late 1980s. There's a lot going on with the dial, but the different size sub-registers make the whole thing look unbalanced. The date is barely legible, and indices at five different lengths doesn't exactly scream clean design, does it? 
And that cabochon crown throws one more element at the design that just doesn't stick at all as far as I'm concerned. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what they thought that would bring to the Keturah overall. And frankly, Paul bought the best of them. At least with the dial markings and the use of colour on his one, it looks quite sporty. Some of the others look extra dated because of the chosen colours. And as I've said a couple of times already, the complete lack of adjustment means you're either too tight or too loose. And with a watch this big, that's never a good thing either way. I mean, I'm not morally opposed to a Seiko on an integrated bracelet. I just think that the current Couture line badly needs a revamp. Perhaps they could offer one in 42 or 43 millimeters, for example. Perhaps they could make those links less polarizing. Perhaps they could take away elements from the dial and handset rather than continuously adding more and more disparate elements to them. Perhaps then I would find a Couture that I would want to feature on the channel because I like it and not because I don't. So there you have it, a well-made and well-spent watch by Seiko that if you find one at the right price, I'm sure will be a faithful companion for decades. But the looks belong in another decade and it's a decade that isn't trendy at the moment. If you want a watch with similar specs for similar money that doesn't look so dated, why not check out the Seiko Sumo Chronograph or something from the Citizen EcoDrive range instead. Thanks for watching, I'll see you again in a future video.